On this week's episode of The Sauce, we start episode one of our new series, Road to Redemptor, where I take a Primaris Redemptor Dreadnought from Sprue all the way to an Iron Hands Really Shiny Boy. Welcome to the sauce painting. I'm Trenton. Every week I'm bringing you guys new content, teaching you guys the secret sauce of how I paint. Most of my channel is dedicated to Games Workshop games, and most of that's dedicated to Warhammer 40,000. If you guys are into Warhammer 40,000 like myself, go ahead and check out my Warhammer 40,000 podcast called The Whack Crusade. Every week, my gaming buddy Andrew and myself talk about what's new in the hobby and how to just get better at it. You can find us pretty much everywhere the podcasts are available, but I'm gonna drop the link for our RSS feed in the description below. On this week's video, we start a very exciting series that I'm pumped up about called Road to Redemptor, where I take a Primaris Redemptor Dreadnought all the way from Sprue to a ridiculously shiny reflective big boy. Throughout this series, I'll be focused on achieving a very reflective surface by using non-metallic metal techniques. A lot of this is gonna be done with an airbrush and I'll also be incorporating things like reflections from the background and the ground into the model to really show how easy it is to make reflective surfaces. 100% honesty here though, I haven't tried a lot of these techniques. So this is also kind of a series on how to just be brave, get inspired by a picture and go out and do it. So total transparency, I hope this works. If not, you guys are gonna have a series on what failing in painting is like, which is totally regular. You guys should be pushing yourself every time you paint anyways. I know I do, and if you wanna improve, that's the fastest way to do it. Truth be told, I've only been painting miniatures for about a year, but I've learned a lot in that amount of time, enough to the point where I feel confident sharing my own techniques. A lot of the techniques I've learned have been through getting inspired, understanding how colors work together, and just trying it out. You guys would be surprised what you can learn from just trying new things, whether you're gonna fail or not, it's all about getting there. I know that's really cheesy, but that's the truth. You guys will learn a lot more about painting by trying something you've never done than redoing the same techniques over and over again. So through this series, I hope to inspire you guys to be brave and try new techniques, but also I hope that this works so you guys can see kind of a cool technique to achieve this using pretty much just an airbrush. Before we jump into this week's, I wanna start off by showing you guys my color palette. So in this week's project, we have Vallejo Game Air Black, we also have a Vallejo model color, dark sea blue, and then big surprise, Vallejo Game Air Wolf Gray. I'm telling you, it is primo. So I got three Primaris Redemptor Dreadnoughts delivered to me through a seller on Facebook. I'm really excited about this project. However, this YouTube video will be focused on just the development of one, but do know that I'll probably be doing the same thing to two others in the meantime. At first when I got these three and I wasn't sure which direction to go with the color scheme until the Iron's Hand supplement for Warhammer 40,000 drop. If you guys are into Warhammer 40,000, and especially if you're in competitive Warhammer 40,000, you probably already know that that Iron Hand supplement is the juice. It is so good. Uh, I don't really have words for it. So these Redemptors are gonna be Primaris Iron Hands. <laughs> so I don't wanna bore you guys too much with a build video, but I will go a little bit into my build theory here. As you can imagine, the cleaner you build the model, the cleaner the end result. When I build models, I only really use a couple tools. The most important one to me is a nice, clean, sharp pair of clippers. I use the Citadel ones from Games Workshop. I love them. I usually use a combination of a couple different types of files and sanding tools. I use nail files for just hard, chunky stuff that I just need to get rid of fast. But for finer, more delicate sanding and smoothing of surfaces, I use the hobby files, which is just kind of a piece of squishy foam with very fine sandpaper on both sides. Depending on the model, I'll also use a small drill for drilling out barrels. I also use the Citadel X-Acto blade at times too. Whenever I build a model, I try to stay as clean as possible through my working areas. If I'm building it excellently, I focus on cleaning up every little piece of the model that I just clipped. So what this means is I'll cut a part off a sprue and clean the entire piece before gluing it to the next piece, which means by the end of the model, every piece has been personally tended to to make sure that it's clean and fits really well together. I know this seems like pretty basic guidance, but it makes a big difference. Another thing that I do is I gently file using a hobby file the edges of the mold where they come together. What I found that this does is create just a little bit of plastic dust that accumulates and sticks into that little tiny crack. This generally fills the crack well enough 
so that I don't have to worry about mold lines. It's very rare that I see my own mold lines or cracks in between and gaps by using this technique. I would say this is just a pretty quick and consistent way to pretty much achieve that perfectly smooth effect with a minimal time investment. So for me, it works great. If you guys wanna see more content of me building models in the future, let me know. But for now, we're gonna fast forward until it's done. One of the next things I did with this project was I primed it gray. I know what you're thinking. This model's supposed to be non-metallic black. Why are you starting with gray? Well, I'm gonna tell you two reasons. The first reason is I really wanted to, you guys to see how I put on a base coat. In this case, the base coat is black. If I was putting a base coat of black over a black primer, it would be nearly impossible to tell what I was doing using the camera to videotape what I'm doing. My camera's not that good. If you guys want to send me a really nice camera that can, hit me up. <laughs> so because of that, I focused on priming with gray so that way you guys could easily see me apply my base coat so you guys could see how I achieve a smooth base coat using an airbrush. The second reason is I was just out of black primer. <laughs> Now we'll get into the base coat. When I base coated this model, I used Vallejo Game Air Black. I really like the color of this black. I know talking about the different shades of black might sound like an insane thing, but I've always really liked the finish to this color. So you guys will see, I kind of start putting it all over the model. I generally thin down my airbrush paints using Flow Improver. I think it helps ensure a nice smooth coat and usually it'll allow me to shoot around 18 PSI, which I think is a really nice pressure for shooting smooth coats. At this point in the model, I'm pretty much just focused on just covering it smoothly and entirely and then making sure that there's none of the gray primer sticking out below. In hindsight, I actually do like basing a model black when it's on top of a gray primer. It helps me make sure that I get a perfectly consistent layer and that everything is very evenly coated because if it wasn't, I would see that gray primer sticking through. In the future, I'm probably gonna actually stick to this method because I also like the way that this color hits full opacity over the gray primer versus putting this color over a black primer, you're gonna get a variation of different types of black. So although this might've started as kind of a uh-oh moment, this actually worked out in my favor. And you guys will see that in the future in many of my videos as I'm not gonna cut out and hide the truth from you guys of how things are going along the way. A lot of painting comes down to just mistakes, learning how to roll with things that don't go your way, trying new things, and hopefully learning along the way. All that should yield better results in the long run. Next, I'm coming in with a model color, Dark Sea Blue. Since this is a model color and not an airbrush color, you have to really cut this color hard. They're very strong pigments, which is great because we're going over black. However, the paint is very thick. I go in probably at least half of the pot with Flow Improver to just a very small amount of paint. You gotta be careful not to overcut it because then you will cut away some of the pigments, but don't be afraid to just have a little bit of leftover paint in your cup at the end. I promise it's totally worth making sure that you have a nice smooth coat. Once I've got this mix up in the pot, you guys will see that I'll start to apply it very, very selectively over certain parts of the metal where I want to begin the transition from a dark black to a bright reflective surface. My inspiration for this model is think about a black shiny sports car in a desert. Using this picture in my mind's eye of what I wanted to achieve with this model for inspiration, I knew that I would need a black that transitions to a very bright color quickly. So this dark blue is going on somewhere in the middle of each panel that's gonna be having some reflections and getting more intense and opaque towards the bright edge of the panel. For now, I don't wanna to spend too much time explaining non-metallic metal theory and which panel should have what light, but for the most part, there's some very basic understandings of non-metallic metal that I know and understand, and I apply these kind of scientifically over the model. However, I will tell you that my focus for non-metallic metal is putting reflections in places that seem cool. Second to that is putting them in places where it makes sense from a light perspective. So really my takeaway for you guys from this is have fun with non-metallic metal. If you're not sure where to put a reflective surface, you could put it where you want and you can change the light and make the light reflect in a way that the vast majority of people looking at your models won't notice the specific light placement and will probably assume it's correct. If you guys wanna see future content on non-metallic metal theory, I would be happy to do a little bit more research myself and put together a video describing how it's done. Just let me know in the comments comments below. At this point in the model, it's pretty hard to tell. My camera's not exactly picking up the transition the way that I was hoping, but there should be faint transitions from black to this really kind of dark turquoise blue. I think this color works great for contrasting black and transitioning it to a very bright highlight. It gives a nice shade transition and our brightest highlight, wolf gray, 
has hints of blue in it. So they really mix well together, creating a nice smooth transition and gradient all the way from black to the brightest highlight. Next, we have my favorite color, Vallejo Game Air Wolf Gray. This is the part of the model where we really do take it to the next level with the reflective surface. We start adding in Wolf Gray at very, very sharp edges of the model where it's going to be the brightest reflection. In the future, we will add reflections from the base of the model and the scenery onto these parts. But for now, it's important to try to achieve almost full opacity with Wolf Gray on these parts. It's gonna be easier to add reflections later and it actually makes sense when you're looking at how bright black can be when it's glossy, it makes sense to have it very bright. So truth be told, in some of this part, I think I went a little bit overboard. And I think the surfaces may be a little bit too reflective, especially on the chest piece. However, for now, I'm just gonna roll with it. Like I said earlier in the video, this is an experiment for me as well. So you guys are gonna see me document my journey from thought all the way to finish. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But for now, I'm a little bit on the fence about the chest. However, I love the rest of the model. The problem I made on the chest is I let the wolf gray hit full opacity right at the bottom of the chest piece. What this does is immediately draw your eyes to that area because it's the brightest points. Although this makes sense and is cool for pictures and is gonna draw your attention to how shiny this really looks, it could take away from the model in the future depending on where I want the point of focus. So I already know that I'm gonna have to take that chest piece, the Aquila, and make it somehow even brighter than Wolf Gray, which is basically almost white. So I've gotta get creative on how to fix this. One solution that I already have is to take those reflective chest pieces and reflect the base of the model back onto them. These models are gonna be based in kind of a reddish desert setting. This is because I think that these colors will contrast really well with the colors that I already have on the model and because I think it'd be fun. So in the future, these colors will be reflected on a chest piece so that could tone it down as well. So although I'm not 100% sure how I really feel about the whole model so far, I'm staying on the path and I think that's the important part. So you guys will see I'm just slowly adding up. The goal here for the Wolf Gray on this model is to hit probably about 90% opacity. 100%, as we've already discussed, is too much. It's gonna make your edge highlights with Wolf Gray also not be able to pop on the model. So you really wanna focus on maybe 80 to 90%. So that way when you do have to edge highlight, you'll hit 100% opacity and it'll really stand out on the model. Now we get into the part where I think non-metallic metal really comes together and that's through the magic of edge highlighting. If you guys are painting non-metallic metals with an airbrush, it's easy for everything to just look blurred together. If you guys really want things to come together, I suggest edge highlighting it. Also my advice for edge highlighting is if you're painting something and are ever not sure, finish up that part and then edge highlight it. If you're still not sure how it looks, then you probably probably are doing the wrong thing, but if you're on the fence or if you think it looks good, stay on that path. Once I started edge highlighting this model, I went from having a lot of questions about whether it was good or not to actually starting to believe that this was going in the right direction. The edge of the model really brings pieces together. Without them, they look like colors just floating in space. Once you have them edge highlighted, they look like very specific pieces of metal. In this case, the Redemptor Dreadnought is covered in large panels. We want these to stand out and be obvious from the rest of the model. Edge highlighting is what really makes that pop. All right, and here's some pictures of the final model. So as you guys can see, this model still has a lot of work to do. To be honest, like I said earlier, I'm not sure if I'm 100% satisfied with some of it, and I've got a feeling the next video will be dedicated to cleaning up some of the things that I'm not totally confident in yet and getting it prepared for the next steps. I hope that this has been a great and educational video on how I'm starting to paint this Redemptor Dreadnought as an Iron Hands model. Stay tuned for the rest of the Road to Redemptor series as I think that we'll cover some really cool topics and we'll get into some serious, serious work using an airbrush on how to hammer out non-metallic metal pretty easily. If you guys like this video, like, subscribe, tell all your friends, and see you guys next week on The Sauce.